How's it going, everybody? Uh, Sean and Steve here for a, uh, I guess, a delayed, there was a slight delay, week eight or episode eight of the Off Key podcast. Uh, Steve and I got away for the weekend with the rest of our fantasy football league because we're fucking nerds. Uh, <laughs> and we had a great weekend, super fun. We played a little music, we talked a little music, uh, we, got, we got really drunk at times. And had NBA a great jam. NBA jam, Reggie Miller in the house with the Pacers, NBA jam tournament edition. Uh, one of the greatest video game comebacks ever seen at two in the morning or three in the morning. Uh, Amazing. Best thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> He's not wrong about that. He was actually very sincere about that after him. But anyways, that's uh, another story for another time. Congratulations on your NBA dominance of our, uh, of our, our fellow league member, Jeff Starr. Uh, so this week's going to be a little different. Steve has been really busy at work doing uh smart people stuff and then uh so he just uh, he doesn't he feels ill prepared this week so we have decided I don't got my facts i don't got yeah. my half-ass internet research well under my i belt. mean uh and i feel like that makes for a better show so we're gonna go a little uh kind of reform just, off the yeah, cuff that's right and um we're gonna see what happens so um <laughs> where would you like to start steve i just i guess i'll ask you that i guess what did you listen to today uh, while you're working so much <laughs> are you asking me i, I will ask myself oh okay okay yeah so what <laughs> were you listening to do today while you were engineering so hard i was super hard engineering um in my my anyways <laughs> uh the front bottoms put out a new album this week and really I, yeah i did not yeah. know that that's um, exciting news in a world of bad, shitty news that we've had all week. And oh, the world is awesome and we love it. <laughs> so that's good. Yeah, that's good. But uh, I, I don't know. I've listened to it like six or seven times already, but I've been a big fan of it so far. Um, six or seven times already. And you started listening to it today? Yesterday. Oh, yes. Sir. Okay. That makes Maybe six or seven. Ago. That makes six or seven definitely possible. I it say, might have been it. eight times. <laughs> If you said, but if you did six or seven in one day, that means like you're like you're fully obsessed with the album. Yeah, That's, I mean, I had yeah. it on repeat a couple times, um, and it's actually the longest one I think they've put out. It's like fifty-two minutes, which is very long by their standards, I think. Yes, that but, uh, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm guessing most of their albums are in the thirty-five to forty-five minute range. Sort of, yeah. I think uh, the, the attention span for most people probably isn't that long. Uh, but I, I don't know. I'm a big fan of it. I think it harkens back to, like, are, you're familiar with the Front Bottoms, right? We saw them together, remember? You forced me to go. I didn't want to go. And then I finally went. And I was like, okay, that was really fun. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, you did go. Because <laughs> I, I, I think I was the one that discovered the song Maps mm -hmm. and then sent it to you. And then I didn't really listen to a lot of their other stuff. And you were like, you should go. Well, because way, way, way back when, I remember you showed me maps, and you're like, check out this music video, and it was them who, like, uh, I don't know, they were playing on, like, a bridge going through New York. Yeah, and, and it was, it was off. Hit. Yeah, and it was off oh. their self-titled debut, and actually, I guess when they made that music video, it was somebody who anonymously approached them on MySpace, and they're like, I want to make a music video for you guys. Yeah, and wasn't it the dude that did, like, uh, what movie did he do? He's, like, a famous director that directed it. Steven that. Spielberg. No. No. But anyways, go on. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to um, Google it on my phone. But I remember you showed me that song, and like way back in the day, I did not like that. But when I saw <laughs> them, we were at Riot Fest, and I don't know if it was after their second album, their second full-length album. They put out seven albums in like seven years. I did not realize the quantity of stuff that they put out. But uh, it was like right after Tale of the Hawk, their second full-length came out, that they were playing out in uh, Riot Fest 2013 or 14 okay and they came on after laura stevenson and i had no idea who they were but the bouncing souls were playing like 20 minutes after their set started and mm -hmm. i wish i would have stayed because i was they came on and the crowd was awesome they were awesome and uh i wanted to go see the bouncing souls who i think were playing too big of a stage for you know that style of music <laughs> or at least the crowd that they had at that show it just wasn't worth it. Like I was, I regretted it immensely that I did not stay to watch the front bottoms at Riot Fest. Okay. Um, but that's kind of when I first got hooked by them. And then I realized later that you had showed me that map song and then that was something I had already heard. Mm -hmm. But um, everything like after that, like those first two albums, the first like two full lengths and then they had the Rose EP 
Uh, mm-hmm. But there was something very, I don't know, like nostalgic or something. I always, in my head, I think of it as like listening to those early front bottoms parties was like going to old high school parties or college parties in basements of people that you knew. Mm-hmm. Like it, the, I don't know, there's something very familiar about it. And I find something very comforting about the front bottoms, as weird as it sounds. But no, like, I really, I loved maps for me was just something very like, uh, I loved his voice. I loved the tone of that whole song. And uh, it's very indie. It's like almost punk. And it's, it's just, I love that song. And then you hear Twin Size Mattress. and Twin really, Size Mattress is amazing. Yeah, it's such a good song. Um, yeah, I loved it. I, I, I loved Maps. And, and as I listened more, I, you know, um, I did think a lot of it was similar, but then each time you hear something, sometimes lyrically, I find his songs really interesting. Uh, but they were super fun live. They were super fun live. I was really happy yeah. after we went because we saw him at the Metro. Yeah. I was really happy afterwards. I was like, all right, I'm really happy that you made me go. Well, there's something like they're very immature. And I feel as though even that their music has progressed to what we are now, which is almost like 10 years, you know, they started in 2008 or something. So they're 12 years into being a band and it's Brian Sella and uh, Matt Oichik, I think is his last name, the drummer, but they're like the two official founding members of it. And pretty much a lot of their content has always been like slightly immature, like slightly emo and everything. And they've never really grown up out of that. But what happens? You are, man. Yeah. But after they put out uh, Talent of the Hawk, which is another one of those like singing about drinking in basements and like getting drunk and jumping in swimming pools kind of albums. Um, Which is what we did last weekend. Exactly. So it it, it encapsulates that whole feeling, I think, for me. Uh, But then they kind of matured a little bit and then they came out with Back on Top and then Going Gray, which added a little bit more uh, electric to it. And they added some synthesizers and stuff. And then they kind of formed them a little bit. It was more polished, I think it was. Because that was the thing is they always sounded like a band playing in a basement. That's the feeling I get. And then they came out with the two, like they signed a Fueled by Ramen. So they kind of got a bit more like production power behind them. They got some money behind them. Yeah. So they got Patrick Stump money behind them. Yeah, but they never lost that sound completely. And then what happened was In Sickness and In Flames, which is the album that came out this week, it was almost like they finally blended the two together. Like they found that perfect balance. I'm laughing so hard because prior to us recording this, you told me how ill prepared you were. For oh. this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Yet here you are just dropping nuggets on top of nuggets on top of nuggets. And once again, I feel that you are completely overprepared for this show that we do. Maybe. So you're an idiot, but please continue uh, that you felt it was blending those two things together. Well, it was, and I think that's what it does. And if, if anybody out there listening... And now to I'm going to have to go listen to it. I, I, I'm probably going to listen to it afterwards. I don't even have my note. I'm ill-prepared. I don't even have my notebook next Leave your notebooks see. away, man. This is free form. We're going off the cuff on off-key this week. <laughs> Anyways, what is Put the your phone down. Week? What is the name of this album? It's called In Sickness and In Flames. And okay. what I think it does is like it... Uh, it really kind of captures both the old essence of like some of the acoustics sort of, uh, I don't know, certain vibes that you got from those earlier albums, but it still smooths it over with a bit of polish. And there's a lot of interludes in between that kind of tie everything together. And there's, mm-hmm. bit, there's also a bit more dynamics, um, you know, in terms of their pacing and stuff, but they still use a lot of tricks that they've used in the past in yeah. terms of like, uh, they use a lot of callbacks in their voice to kind of emulate not necessarily like gang chant vocals like a hardcore band might have, but like it's Brian Sella singing over top of himself. Self, as, yeah. Just which, layered, vo- layered vocals. Yeah, and all that is is like if you were seeing them live, those are the parts where the people would actually be singing out loud and like yeah. chanting along. Yeah. Um, so you get a lot of those elements. And like there are some tricks that they use that – You know, they've been on every album, but there's a lot of new stuff, I think, that they do. And there's a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, cohesiveness, I think, to the album. But, uh, you know, just like a little like I think lyrically, this one kind of fell 
uh, a little flatter, like not nothing really kind of struck through. Uh, but there's a couple of songs on there that I think are really good. New song D uh, was really good. Uh, Leaf Pile was really good. And then um, I really like the last track too. But they definitely, they I think they've broadened their horizons of their sound uh-huh. while sticking true to that whole thing. And they, they always sound like the front bottoms. And yeah. I don't think there's many bands that sound like them. You know what's crazy is my roommate actually uh, played this band for me not too long ago. You can look this up. Uh, he played it, and I said, is that the front bottoms? He goes, no, but they sound exactly like the front bottoms. Oh. And so – this dude, the guy whose band this was, got so much flack. I don't know what band it was. Uh, I can't remember. I'd have to ask him about it. The back people, tops. Uh, it's, honestly, <laughs> it might as well have been that. People were ripping this band to shreds. Like, dude, you are a front bottoms ripoff in every way possible. Like, like, just tearing this dude apart. Yeah. And apparently they broke up and stopped making music. That bad? Yeah. Like, I heard it, and I heard multiple songs, and I was like, yeah, it sounds exactly like the front bottoms. Like, oh, exactly like it. I probably people, love it. <laughs> people were just destroying this dude. It was crazy. I was like, wow, people are just tearing this guy apart. Yeah. Um, but the front bottoms, Maps, that was like, if you've never listened to the front bottoms, which I, I have a feeling that the people that listen to this show um, – which we had 29 downloads this week. I don't know how many streams we had. I just want to thank everybody for listening. It's been awesome to see the numbers grow little by little. It's, it's cool for us to watch. and um, We hope you're enjoying it, like I said, as much as we have fun making it each week. Uh, but Maps for me was the song that really turned me on to them. And I think um, when you, you know, if there's two key tracks to go listen to the front bottoms, if you've never listened to them, it's Twin Size Mattress and it's Maps. Yeah, definitely Twin Size Mattress. <laughs> so... If, if you don't like twin size mattress, just stop listening and give up. You're not gonna like it. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, maps is—I don't know. Maps is just as up there for me. But yeah, uh, Steve, that was perfect. We're like that's like ten minutes on the button for the front bottoms. Right oh my there. gosh! Like so, we're we on pace. Script? Yeah, Phil. I mean, we're on pace for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, that was just something uh, I, I listened to today and. Uh, yeah. Did All right. you, what'd you listen to? <laughs> so if we're doing, I guess this is our something new, whether we, you know, said it'd be off nah, form. No, but format. no, no, it's something new. Suck it. Um, <laughs> okay. So I, I found out that death Cab released an EP in 2019 that I didn't even know about, which what is, what is it called? Uh, the, I believe it's called the blue EP. Oh, uh, is that that? Oh, obviously the one that you posted earlier. Yeah. I, I know I, that. I, yeah, but it's uh, it's fine. I already forgot the name of it. So, um, get out of here. Oh no, Pandora's gonna start playing in a second. I apologize. Um, we can't have musical samples, Sean. No, we can't. Spotify uh, and Apple will kick us off if we use music. Uh, the Blue EP. That's that is what it's called. So it's five songs. Um, it's nothing to me. Like it was enjoyable. I really enjoyed the first track. The first track is called To the Ground. Um, I really do feel that since probably Codes and Keys, the general tone of Death Cab albums has changed a lot. Yeah. Um, Wasn't that when and, Ben Walla left? Uh, Chris Walla. And, Very. Um, I think Walla may have still been there for Codes and Keys. Uh, but I don't necessarily, I, I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. Um, and maybe Chris Waller will eventually find his way back because I just don't feel like I've really heard about much from him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I still think his letter about leaving the band was truly pretentious, but that's just my opinion. Oh, please tell me. All, I've never heard of this. Uh, you know, I've never talked to you about this. What is just, this? Just what look is... up Chris Waller's letter about leaving Death Cab and... <laughs> Give me the give me the bullet point. Just the general gist of it was like, to me when I read it, it just felt like I'm better than what's going on here, and I have more to prove. And it was just very. That's the feeling I got. If I read it again today, it I might get a different feeling about it. You know, okay, I might, but I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, but when I first read it, I was like, "Wow, dude!" Like, uh, 
it just felt like uh, to me chris i know is a producer and mixer and, and a huge part of the band mm. but ben is just as much a part of the band as you are and uh, like i felt like maybe he possibly lost sight of how important that tandem was uh and he didn't even write all of Death Cab's songs, right? He just wrote some notable ones. That's what I understand. Uh, without... I, I can't speak to what he wrote or didn't write. I, I know, know he was... Brothers no, on no. a Hotel Bed was his. Um, That's a great song. Which is, uh, I think, up there with me in terms of like... It's a great them. song. Yeah. But I don't know if he's written like all of them or if it was co-written with him and, and Gibbard. Uh, uh, but... Either way, I just always felt like his letter about leaving the band was exceptionally pretentious. <laughs> like, Very pompous. Yeah, like, uh, it, but anyways, you can look it up. You can read it. Okay. Um, but back to the album, back to the Blue Yeah, EP. so the Blue EP, there's this song, Kids in 99, the second track on the album, which I didn't have time to look up what it's about, but it's clearly about, like, some horrible disaster of like right up my alley yeah oh no. bring on the molasses I was, think, I was thinking of you like when i heard it okay so the lyrical content of the song contains something about like in a way that you know ben gibbard has a very exceptional way of writing songs about this type of thing so from what i understand it sounds like there were kids playing in like a quarry or down by this lake and there was this gas leak from this company in being like basically just let out into the lake and they lit off fireworks and literally a giant explosion happened Jesus! and it sounds like the kids died uh based on the song and it sounds pretty terrible uh um, yeah yeah tell me more uh i mean it's like do you kidding. want me to look up I'm the lyrics kidding. i don't know so anyways, uh, love Kids in 99, songs. but I will say To the Ground uh, was probably my favorite song on the album. And there's only five tracks, but the end of To the Ground, there's this kind of unexpected part that comes up that I really enjoyed uh, musically. It reminded me almost of some of the end of their older songs or the bridges of their older songs. I, but I will say, like, back to what I was saying earlier, I do think that the general tone of Death Cab albums has changed a lot since Codes and Keys. I feel like there's been kind of this, I don't even necessarily know how to describe it. Maybe it's more of like a melancholy, melodic tone to a lot of the albums. Let's do a quick rundown from album to album. It's well, it's like, it's Kintsugi, it's Codes and Keys, and then it was Thank You for Today, I believe. Okay. Um, but... To me, like when you look at transatlanticism and plans, which are obviously, I mean, then there's the photo album, but to me, the definitive Death Cab stuff for me was transatlanticism and plans. Like those two albums, I really think you can hear a full range, but I don't know. There's just, um, I guess there kind of lacks like an upbeat energy sometimes now to a lot of what they put out which doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad it's mm -hmm. just it's not what it doesn't have the the kind of um the up and down kind of vibe that i've always looked for from the albums that i you know like i i, I guess that's the best i i think that's the best way to describe it and i like i said man if you disagree with me like whatever comment on our instagram and tell us we're, we're dumb or whatever but like i could talk about death camp for days for I, days you know i could yo but. i know you could i i think with transatlanticism and with plans to me those albums had a sense of like putting a a warm wet blanket over you <laughs> like, maybe not wet but a yeah, warm blanket say a, warm, a warm wet blanket doesn't really make any sense that just, sounds kind of awful like there's something about it um yeah, a warm blanket is probably better than a wet blanket. Um, but there's something that like it it kind of covers you. Like there's a there's an atmosphere to it. I think they and I, I just thinking off the cuff in terms of like songs like what Sarah said and what uh, Brothers on a Hotel Bed. Like these songs that kind of like put you in a place. 
and I feel like you get down onto the level of the song. Don't even get me started with the lyrical content of Death Cab. It's just too much. It's too much well, to handle. They're well, too good. Well, because the thing <laughs> is, I think that maybe in, lyrically, I haven't paid as much attention. I know that after they had plans, they had whatever the album was with Grapevine Fires. Um, I can't remember the name of it. It was that. Third... Oh, I forgot about uh, that's. Um, that was uh, a... that album was awesome. It was nominated for album of the year. That album was the shit. Uh, it starts with Brixby Canyon Bridge. It has yeah. Grapevine Fires on it. Um, I think that also think? had uh, Twin Size Mattress on it. What was the song about Twin Size Mattress? Oh, uh, Twin yeah, Size I, Bed. I th- yeah, Twin Size Bed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, his head was a city of paper buildings. The echoes that remain. Um, I, I can't re- Dude, that album is... But that one's like wedged right in the middle, and I feel like it was their transition point where they were trying to, you know, the first two albums, they were really popular with maybe like an NPR crowd, um, like more of... Well, the, they had, they did, you can play these songs with chords, the photo album, uh, and those albums don't really get talked about a lot. Yeah, uh, but once they hit that middle point, I think they kind of got like the cue. Narrow stairs. Yes. Narrow stairs. Yeah. So it was Transatlanticism, then Plans, then Narrow Stairs. And those three albums will, like, wreck your head. They're amazing. All three yeah. of them are fantastic. And for me, it probably goes Transatlanticism, Narrow Stairs, then Plans. Um, but they did the photo album, the 2001. They did, uh, what was it? Uh, you Can Play These Songs with the Chords in 97. And those and were then, just, like, demo tapes. So that wasn't really, like, no, an album. I think no, that the was fo- no, a no, no, collection no, no. of songs. Um, was the photo album was a full length album. I have that one, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, I apologize, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, the photo album was 14 tracks, uh, and it has styrofoam plates on it, which is just, just unbelievable. You love that song. Yeah, I, how could you not love that song? I have not Go heard listen. it in a long time. Go I still listen remember- to that song. It's, you love yeah. sad songs, Steve? Go with some styrofoam plates. What is it about? I forget. It's about his friend's father. Um, and his friend's dad uh, was, I believe, his friend in Colorado. His dad was apparently a giant piece of human shit. And uh, he wrote the song about his friend's dad and going to his friend's dad's funeral, I believe. And... I mean, the song is ruthless. Um, you know, I thought it was about like a picnic. <laughs> no, the the song is, it, well, he mentions, uh, uh, he talks about styrofoam plates, cafeteria tables, um, being at this kind of eulogy for this guy's father. And it's just kind of, it sounds like it's very cheaply done. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. It, that song, I remember where I was the first time I heard it. I was writing a paper in the yeah. library and the song came on and I'd never heard it before. Mm-hmm. And I was probably would have been like 2007. So early, early in my death cab discovery. And I stopped writing after I heard the first line of the song and just kept listening. And I was like, wow, that is a soul crusher. And uh, I need to hear it again. And it's awesome. So if you've never heard styrofoam plates, I thoroughly encourage you to go listen to it. Um, sorry, my cable is stuck under my chair. And uh, <laughs> yeah, go listen to it. It's awesome. And this EP is interesting. Uh, it's five songs. It definitely has that tone of thank you for today and like codes and keys. Um, it's not bad, but it just wasn't. You know, I got excited when I, I heard a song pop up on my Pandora and I was like, this is Death Cab, but I've never heard this song. And then I looked down, and I was like, the blue EP. I was like, what the hell is this? And why haven't yeah. I heard about it? And then I looked it up and I was like, oh, it came out recently. Like, how did this not somehow pop up in one of my like Google News or, you know, whatever? <laughs> how did my cookies not know that I needed to know that this album came out? That's how what did, I want to know. How did the algorithms not figure yeah. out? Well, it, what, was, what was the EP they put out a couple of years ago? It was the Open Door EP, which yes. was awesome. It's four oh. tracks, and I remember I've listened to it like I back. believe it's six. It's uh, My Mirror Speaks. It's got uh, Talking Bird, 
Little Bribes. Um, little Bribes is awesome. Little Bribes is an amazing song. It's catchy as hell. Oh, it's so good. But that's what I'm saying. So, like, that's a perfect example. Uh, I don't hear things of that nature from them anymore. It's like, more just... Li- little Bribes, uh, Sound of Settling, like those types of songs mm-hmm. don't seem to hit albums for me or hit their albums anymore. Um, whereas before I felt there was this kind of like up and down, like, uh, some very emo stuff at times. And then these very kind of poppy, but like, I don't know how to describe it. But these very like poppy, energetic indie folk songs, I guess, yeah. uh, that were also on the album. And I feel like a lot of the stuff lately is lacking that. And yeah, maybe it's just because they, I don't want to say generic. Anytime anything starts getting radio friendly, it starts uh, maybe, I don't want to say dumbing it down because it's like you could still be on the radio and still make good songs. Um, but I think there's a difference between painting a picture with lyrics in terms of like when, you, and I keep going back to it, but what Sarah said where uh, he's, it's it's an incredibly sad song of painting a picture of like people friends like waiting around in a hospital room and the imagery that goes around and it doesn't sound like a sad song but you can also just sing something very generic like i'm sad i'm so sad yeah but (laughs) at the same i mean at the same time though like i will follow you into the dark was extremely popular that sounds super sad that's true um so like to argue against your point i just think like Sound of Settling was a super popular song, which got licensed out to, I think a Mazda commercial was how one of the reasons. Did it got they not super... listen to the lyrics? Uh, <laughs> Settling for so, a Mazda. But. Uh, <laughs> not I, believe, that I think that's, with I, my think brand. that's I think that's like, uh, I, I want to say that's where I heard it. No, uh, no brand would ever want to be like, hey, settle yeah, but for the us. Song, the song is catchy. But that's the thing uh, is they can do that. And like when you can sneak those <laughs> very serious lyrics, because the song is about like a relationship of somebody settling and just being like, hey, you're good enough. I will settle down with you. Um, um, but it's very defeated in the in the message of it, I think. <laughs> like I couldn't find anyone better, so you'll do. <laughs> Not like, hey, I'm settling down because we're in love. <laughs> But, Dude, it was definitely uh, there's some sort of use in a commercial with one of their songs, and I thought it was it. But anyway, regardless, so that was my my I guess our something new, even though we're not sticking to the format this week. Uh, uh, the blue EP. If you're a Def Cat fan, check it out. I think you'll enjoy it uh, to some regard, and you should definitely check out Kids uh, Kids in '99 because it's terribly sad or at least the lyrical content sounds Count me terribly in. sad That's and what I want. dark so i guess we uh, could segue to a sort of mailbag thing if you want to do it sure you segue to whatever the hell you want buddy it's our show we can do whatever the we had want. a request to talk about give up by the postal service oh okay that works so i mean we're still talking on we're on the gibbard train all night but <laughs> um i know uh, our, our buddy tang requested us uh, to talk about Give Up by the Postal Service. And uh, I, for those of you who do not know, this was in the days before everyone was quarantined together making albums. Uh, this is when people actually uh, got together and made albums. But back in the day, Ben Gibbard, and I can't remember the female or the other person who helped songwrite with him, but they sent albums or they sent recordings back and forth through the mail. And that's where they got the name Am I correct? It's uh, Jimmy Tamborello and Jenny Lewis is on background vocals. Jenny Lewis, yeah. She did. Uh, uh, on Wikipedia, they are described as an American indie pop supergroup. <laughs> okay. I <laughs> even do though not... they really only released like an album and a half, if I remember correctly. I don't even think they released a second. They was No, it... that's why I said a half. They released, uh, there was like an EP with like, oh, remixes on like it, which B-sides I have. sides and stuff. It's the, the something silhouette, I think. What was the other uh, guy's name? Jimmy Tambourine? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, but that's a sweet name for a music guy. Uh, <laughs> Jimmy Tambourine. <laughs> Jimmy Tamborello. Uh, okay, and, that was close. Je- yes, you were. And Jenny Lewis. Um, but yeah, they made the album through email. Uh, so basically, from what I remember, like one of them would work on this and then 
send it and they kind of redo and re edit things. I thought they things. physically sent it. That would have taken forever. <laughs> no, I believe they did it via email. Um, the group formed from it was 03 or 04. I know that. 01 to 03, but the album yeah. came, got really popular in like 03. Um, because I think there was uh, something like, uh, excuse me. Oh, that was a nice one, Steve. It was very, <laughs> very nice to record. Um, no, I, I remember like first, like freshman year of college, people talking about that. Um, and how everyone was like, yeah, they mailed it back and forth. And it's like this totally new way of recording music. <laughs> Tamborello, uh, Tamborello. This is according to Wikipedia. Uh, Tamborello wrote and performed the instrumental tracks, then sent uh, DATs, uh, which I'm assuming is digital something, uh, to Gibbard through the United States Postal Service. Yeah, I see, they did. I thought it was via email. I'm sure they did some stuff electronically. Like it would take forever. Oh, digital audio it. tape. Oh. So he would just send the tapes to Ben via via uh, the USPS. Okay. So, uh, you know, thank God that the Postal Service wasn't defunded back then because we wouldn't have the Postal Service help. Right. So. <laughs> this, this episode is a full endorsement of the United States Postal Service. <laughs> we need that so, shit. Oh, I'm going to take this ice pack off my back. Um, <laughs> fuck, we're getting old. Aching for uh, carrying this episode all. Oh, my God. Yeah, it hurts, Steve. Um, even though you were extremely well prepared fucking liar oh, I was uh, just making stuff up but uh yeah the postal service give up i that album was awesome it's just another reason i became like because i basically got to discover that album and transatlanticism pretty much simultaneously i was working at best buy so i was always getting discounts on cds and you know obviously at the time most of our cars had cd players and whatnot so i was just constantly buying cds uh and it was great I actually have Holy Christmas this uh, is straight for the video. By right the way. here. Right here. Look at all of those. Oh look my at, gosh. Look That's, at them all, ladies and gentlemen. Book. It is a CD book. I was going through this to give Steve homework this week, which he probably failed to do because he's ill prepared. He's not I am. A professional. I am. But that's okay. Because uh, neither am I. And so, what's. Uh, Give me some tracks on, on, on Give Up. What do you like about the album? <laughs> One thing I did read about it was that the United States Postal Service actually sent a cease and desist order to the band for using the name and breaking trademark with them. Really? <laughs> yeah. I, I, had, just... I had heard that, but I didn't actually believe it. I... <laughs> It's just funny that we're endorsing the Postal Service, but they actually tried getting the Postal Service shut down. Um, uh, well, that's weird because if it was called the United States Postal Service, I could kind of see them having a case, but it was just called the Postal Service. Yeah, I mean, it kind of like went away, but it reminds me of this other thing that came up with uh, this band called United Nations. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a, it was a like kind of hardcore grindcore like <laughs> musical supergroup. And okay. using that same super group term. Um, it was oh, the only identifiable me, person was Jeff Rickley of Thursday. Okay. Because every other band member had to remain anonymous because of uh, record deals that they had. Because they were all on different labels, but they wanted to create this like uh, <laughs> this kind of group together. Uh, but it was, they created a campaign of like misinformation where they would just continually like fuel these uh, fake stories. And this was back like 2005 or six, I think that this album came out, but. So they uh, were doing this on like live journal. <laughs> yeah. Back, way back in the day, it was mostly like MySpace and stuff, but they, they came out and um, they, uh, the United Nations, the actual, you know, global United Nations sent a cease and desist order to them to stop using their name. Um, but, I don't know, there's more to it. I'll get into it in another deeper dive. It's but. just it's just stunning that they didn't have bigger fish to fry at this time. Oh yeah. That they had, you know, uh, <laughs> they were sending cease and desist letters to a hardcore band. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about Give Up though. Um, what do you like about it? What 
if there's anything you don't like about it, what what's what's going on there? Uh, I mean, obviously, the such great heights is you know an iron and wine cover uh, for those of you who do not know. But the yes, most, that's true. It is the most popular song off that album, kind of like the big single I think they came out with. Um, but I mean the album itself i never really got super into until like years later when i gave it much more of a chance really uh, well because i was expecting something else. i'm going i'm going back to the track listing now and i'm literally like that song's awesome that song's awesome that song's awesome that song's awesome yeah guess what that song's awesome <laughs> like, i just went through the track list and i was like man i can't wait to listen to this album again especially like tracks like recycled air oh mm-hmm. so good I couldn't even remember it. I know. Recycled Air is, you want to talk about like setting the scene and what we talked about with the songs, like what Sarah said and uh, forget what other song you had mentioned in that same regard. Um, Recycled Air is about being on an airplane. And. uh, Is it? Yeah. It's, it's like how they recycle the air through and like the the core, the chorus line is like the stale taste of recycled air. Um, And he says, I watch. Oh, I do uh, remember that now. I watch the patchwork farms, the stale, a uh, stale or fade into the ocean's arms. And he's talking about when you're on a plane and you're taking off. And that's the thing, like you and I always talk a lot about writing and song lyrics. And, you know, if you're enjoying the podcast and you want us to keep talking about it more, I hope so, because we're probably going to continue to keep talking about that stuff. <laughs> but there are so many times when I listen to songs written by Ben Gibbard that, I sit there and think of the lines and I'm like, I could write for a thousand straight days, 24 hours a day and never hit a line that perfect. Never. And it is just stupidly good. What that dude comes up with. It's just not it. Like people shouldn't be able to describe things in the fashion that he's found how to describe them. Well, It's, it's It's not even fair. It's not yeah, only it's that, disgusting. but disgusting. Yeah, because not only can he create like one single line that describes like a certain uh, scene or moment or emotion perfectly in ways that are extremely creative and very like poetic in nature, and make uh, you hate your lack of ability to write such things. Yeah, but he can <laughs> he can write one line of that, which I don't think I could ever do, and then he <laughs> can. He, he can string a whole song together and put it to music and make it sound good. I know. I and know. He's a beast, dude. I, yeah. I've been saying it for years. Uh, I think he's the best songwriter of our generation. I, I don't. And please, if you listen to this and you follow us on Instagram and you think that there's somebody comparable to him that we haven't talked about or that maybe I haven't heard of from a songwriting perspective, please, please. Like, let me know because I wanna, I wanna, I wanna hear that. I really do. Like, not it, not to say that this person's better than the other person. I just want to hear somebody that's in his same realm. Because to me, I don't really think there's many people in his realm. Yeah. And so, um, know. well, even though like uh, this place is a prison, I think was my uh, great song. I think that was probably one of my favorites off of that album, and it's basically just talking about. It was like being stuck in a bar, right? And it was like just I don't even know. I've always want I yeah, it's this place is a prison armed to the teeth. I know that's like the the opening line, right? Yeah, and it was like basically talking about being in a bar and like just partying and everything and there was something about the uh the the sound of that that was just very like eerie. Oh, it's sort of super it's super eerie. Intense and um You know, you could just feel like you're in the booth of a club and like you're just you feel like you're cornered by all these fake people. Um, There's like a there's a scratching sound on that recording. Like, I don't know how to describe it. Almost like maybe um, like if you rub a coin on a glass, that type of thing, like it's incorporated into like the melody of the song. It's a really interesting recording. That's cool. And I know he actually did an episode of that song Exploder and I kind of want to go back and listen to it now um, where he breaks down one of the Postal Service songs. Uh-huh. I'm pretty sure. Um, and it might have it been Jimmy Tambourine, not him. <laughs> uh, 
But I always love that line of, and I know it's not a party if it happens every night. Yep. Like, it's just kind of one of those that sums it up so perfectly, <laughs> like, when things have gotten out of hand. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I thought that song was great. Um, but it's been so many years since I've actually listened to it. I have to go back and, and give that another go. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. Outside of... Uh, I'm trying to think of something that's comparable to Ben Gibbard and his dance moves. If you've never seen him perform, have you ever seen his dance? Like when he kind of plays guitar and he like shimmies back and forth. Uh, I mean, I've seen them three times now, thankfully. Uh, <laughs> but like, but he does that like hip shaking thing. Where I kind of know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like I can visualize it in my head. It's a hard workout if you do it. Like, <laughs> Just watch him and then, like, get in front of the TV and kind of, like, stand there for 45 minutes and, can like, do the back and forth thing. I think frontmanning a band or playing standing up for an hour minimum, like, is a workout in general. Like, yeah. regardless, like, uh, when I play along, like, you know, because I'm a fucking hippie nerd, when I put, like, fish shows on and I play for, like, 45 minutes straight, like, there's... I'm not even writhing around and like do, do shit like that. I'm more focused on like, am I in the right key? Oh, they just changed it. Now I got to figure this shit out. Like, but at the same time, like I'm thinking a lot, I'm standing up and processing a lot. And by the end of it, I'm like, I'm kind of tired. I need, <laughs> I need 20 minutes. Let's not, I don't know how drummers have the endurance to do what they do. Cause they've been doing it their whole life. I know. And they get to sit down while they're doing it still man like sometimes i hold a phone to my ear and like after two minutes in a phone call it's, like, it's a little too much <laughs> yes but also okay to defend that ridiculous statement <laughs> your arm is basically in the same place mm -hmm. a little bit different uh but anyways, don't defend it there's no defending that <laughs> i'm trying i'm trying to help you the sign that i need to work uh, out is like crack another beer <laughs> These are, the only, these are the only arm curls I need to do. Uh, by the way, one of the songs I wanted to talk about real quick is Nothing Better on that album. Uh, I feel is this great kind of uh, like poetic argument between lovers and like ex-lovers. Uh, I don't know if you remember the lyrics, but uh, so he's obviously been broken up with and uh, He's, he says, you know, that you're deserting for better company. I can't accept that it's over. Uh, and I will block the door like a goalie tending the net in the third quarter of a tied game rivalry. Yes. Um, Is that the one where they have the back and forth? Where they're yeah, it's like, great. It's a beautiful, like, argument, a, like, poetic argument in the song. Yeah. And she goes, I feel I must interject here. You're getting carried away feeling sorry for yourself with these revisions and gaps in history. So let me help you remember, I've made charts and graphs that should finally make it clear. I've prepared a lecture on why I have to leave. Uh, so please back away and let me go. And then he responds with, I can't, my darling, I love you so. Great song. Like, I mean, just, we've all, most people for the most part, unless you married your high school sweetheart or the first girl you, first person you ever dated. Yeah. And you're still married to that person. Most of us have played this exact lyrical content in our head and or with that person. And I just think it's so deadly accurate. Uh, so nothing better is, is a lyrical song that's like, it's, it's, it's stunningly good. I think everybody should, uh, should check that one out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are now 44 minutes in, Steve. Let us, let us move off the Ben Gibbard uh, love train to something else. <laughs> the what do you got for me? Uh, so there was something I listened to this week, and it was uh, this avant-garde album, and it was um, called The Disintegration Loops by William Basinski. Let's get weird. All right, let's get weird. <laughs> so it was... The the story behind it was this guy, he's, uh, and I don't know much about him, but he's kind of a, he's in the ambient avant-garde, like musical realm. So okay. back in the 80s, he kind of recorded a bunch of things uh, off of like shortwave radios 
and he recorded them to tape and he had an archive of like very old tapes of just you know ambient noises classical music all this stuff uh so come the turn of the century he wants the tapes are starting to get old and bad and he wants to update them so that they're basically digitized so he, he's trying to record them so that his uh, he can keep them basically yeah so um he starts recording these albums and he's got them on these like tape reels and i don't know what they're made of but he's recording them and as they're recording every time they go around they lose a little bit of the tape and the uh-huh. adhesive starts coming apart. So what he did was he just started recording it and he recorded these loops and every time it would loop, it would get a little more brittle and a little disintegrate a little more. And that's why they call it the disintegration loops. <clears throat> so it's like the, I think in total he released like a nine box, uh, like five CD set. I think it's, I only listened to maybe like two hours of it, <laughs> but uh, the, the important part about it is that the first track, it's, uh, the, the important part about it is that as he was recording this and he got through all the tapes that he was recording and digitizing, the morning he finished was 9-11, uh, 2001. Mm-hmm. And he had a uh, an apartment in Brooklyn, and he just he sat on his roof and watched as like the twin towers fell. And All right. So he, <laughs> uh, you know, he he set kind of like a film and like photo, um, like a time lapse basically of the day, and kind of like created this entire like sort of moment. But you listen to this this horn as it's repeating for hundreds of times uh, in this song. And it slowly just like breaks down slowly and slowly until it becomes nothing. And it was this weird sort of like 63 minute track, but I listened to the entire thing. Yeah. Um, somehow you're not prepared to do the show this week. I love it. <laughs> Cause I spent most of my time listening to, um, you know, these ambient noises and ambient's just such a weird genre in general because it's pretty awesome. I mean, I, I've gotten into things like Brian Eno and uh uh what the hell's the name of it? Hammock um is another one where I, I can really appreciate kind of what they do and they create beautiful soundscapes. <laughs> Another Gabe reference. From That's office. three. That's three out of eight episodes we've referenced Gabe from The Office. But, but I think this, this podcast is really just about soundscapes. That's oh, that's all, all pod, it is. That's all this podcast is about. But um, I think what was interesting was that they like the ten year anniversary of nine eleven. They actually performed this song live. So who this, did this like, gentleman? A symphony. Oh, so really? That, so if you listen to it, it's the same like 10 second horn loop of this. I don't know if it was from like a classical like recording he had, but it's almost like this very sad like. But wait, isn't the horn, isn't the horn from the sound of whatever's going on during the disaster? No, this is what he had recorded um, in the 80s. And then he was trying to digitize it as the tapes were breaking apart. And as Uh the tapes were breaking apart, 9-11 happened. And it gave context and imagery to what he was doing and the idea of disintegration being kind of captured with the, um, the visuals of the Twin Towers falling and the the day after it's hard to explain but you should like go check it out it's just like an interesting story and it's very it's it's beautiful in its own way but you have to have the patience for it if you just go in listening to it then you'll never really uh i think appreciate it. we're getting into the range for me uh, or at least it sounds like we're getting into the range to me of like questionable art it's interesting like what you're saying is interesting yes but i i need to go like uh dive into it a little bit myself and decide like 
should a symphony have played this? Well, and that's that's the that's thing. That's my question. Like, uh... <laughs> well, the, I mean, that's the thing about it is because to have human beings play the same like ten second thing over and over and slowly make it like you know you Break play it with, down. Yeah. So every time you play, you play it with a little less air going through your mm-hmm. horn. You yeah. play with a little less you know emphasis on the strings. But taken out of that context of 9-11 and uh, the idea is very interesting in terms of you're just basically taking the sound of something breaking down. I will but, say that the idea is very interesting. I don't but, know if uh, I, I, I don't know if I'll give this guy two hours of my time. Well, that's the thing. I think the entire thing altogether was like four or five hours. How the hell did you find this? Uh, <laughs> I don't even know. You're an idiot. I, was I love like, you. I, I was, love you. You're an idiot. I was. I was looking. And you're not. You're not an idiot at no. all. I love you very much. But I, yeah, I, it's I, just only you. Only you. Which is why I love doing this show with you. I was. I was trying to Google things that were like albums to focus to because I had a lot of work to do this week. So I was trying to find something that I'm like, all right, what can I put on and really just like focus on my work. And this was one of the oh, albums. Anything by up. like Beethoven or Mozart, dude. All that is phenomenal to focus to. Yeah, but have you ever heard Beethoven disintegrate? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> so good. I just... Uh, but yeah, it's just... It's a weird thing because, again, like, without the added elements, like, it. this is like a highly regarded album. It's It was on... By a, who? like a lot of people in in 2004 i think it was released in 2003 but it was on a lot of end of year lists um and i know pitchfork is not necessarily like our style uh because they no but that seems totally something that pitchfork would be like you have to go listen to this (laughs) it's the most important thing that's been recorded in the last 25 years (laughs) but now I'm going to lose. And that. I've been to Pitchfork Music Festival and I had a great time. But that, so I, I guess segueing from that. Regardless. Something else I listened to. Um, Hold on real quick. I want to say something. Uh, so as far as soundscapes go, I have one for you that I found like probably about a year ago. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, the full name of it is Relaxing Sleep Music colon Deep Sleeping Music on YouTube. Uh, Actually, I apologize. It's uh, deep sleeping music, relaxing music, stress relief. It's awesome. It's like three hours long of just like basically something you can meditate or sleep to. Super enjoyable. Thoroughly suggest you check it out to anybody that wants to like relax or just try and like, you know, clear their head. Have and, you? Have I what? Um, have you heard of binaural beats? Yeah, we talked about this years ago. I know. I want to talk yeah. about it. <laughs> no, uh, I, I know. Yes. Two minutes. I, Give me two minutes. <laughs> fine. You got two minutes. Go. So, can so, you still can you still find this? Yeah, man. They're all over the place. But okay. what, what binaural beats are is that it's music that it's alternating wavelengths, and these these go back all the way to like Native American times where people would drum. You'd have like people would meditate in a drum circle. Mm-hmm. And on your right, you would have one drum that was, you know, banging a rhythm. And on your left, you would have another drum at a slightly different frequency. But what binaural beats are those alternating frequencies that allows your brain to have uh, what they call entrainment, where it's trying to balance the two noises. And it mm-hmm. creates uh, when you Almost get like to- a hypnosis, right? Yes. And uh, depending on the frequency of uh, of the of the pitch of it I think that's the correct term so like lower ones will make you sleepier higher ones will make you more focused uh, but <laughs> there's a lot of these different things that they allow you to kind of like focus in and like if you're talking about meditation and stuff they can play these brain tricks on you and I know we've talked about this like before um, I've listened to them yeah I downloaded them on my old computer like literally probably 13 years ago 
Yeah. And they don't work for everybody. I think they work for me. And I think they cause like you to have really cool dreams and real deep thoughts. Yeah. We, t- I know we, we did, we tried the lucid dream one. It never really worked for me. Yeah. Um, you just have to also, give it a lot of chances. No, absolutely. I definitely think you have to give it a lot of chances, but no, this is more of like a soundscape. This isn't more like, this isn't uh, binaural beats like that type of thing. Oh, this is more of just a soundscape, but it's really, really enjoyable. Like, I, I love it. Uh, I've, I've pulled this one up many times before in the last like year, um, to just relax and like, you know, dude, it, it helps with so many ranges of like, you can't sleep, you have anxiety, you have like depression, like it helps relax the mind in ways that like, you know, I don't think anyone thing else really can. Like it's sometimes the only thing that like will put me to sleep if I can't sleep. No, definitely. The only thing uh, I found that is better for putting me to sleep is Planet Earth and the sweet sounds of David Attenborough. That I'm not joking, David. And and it's I, I can pull up an article that that has scientific evidence backing it that Planet Earth encourages sleep. I could believe that. Yeah, I'm, it's dude. I can fall asleep to I. I you hear can fall asleep to Planet. No, I can fall asleep to planet Earth. It's it it is so incredibly relaxing and, and I hope David Attenborough never dies because he should just narrate everything. <laughs> it's he's awesome. Uh, as you're making breakfast in the morning I, I, just, and he cracks the egg. <laughs> yeah, dude. I've said this before. I've had this idea in my head for a while. I would love to start a band uh and and write songs just based on planet earth like what like what you're seeing like a hawk being a hunting a fish or something like that it's amazing and, and write songs about it and call the band david and the attenboroughs i would listen to that that's what i love about like i know you would for sure you I, just talked about a guy putting disintegrating tapes on a loop for <laughs> two hours along with 9 11 tying yeah. into it somehow so yes i know you would listen to my secret project called david and the attenboroughs there's a guy um i was thinking about it today and he made like some band like i i want to do a whole episode dedicated to like in ridiculous metal theme bands because we've talked about austrian death machine it's like a arnold schwarzenegger inspired metal band they also have uh i've heard an elon musk inspired metal band Mm -hmm. um they just talk about Elon Musk taking like the world to Mars. Uh, there's a Ned Flanders inspired metal band. <laughs> yes, that I have listened. I, I can't yes. remember what their name is. Um, but I will. But anyways, but I was going to say when you were talking about Pitchfork Music Festival, and I actually Oakley have... Dokley is the name of the Ned Flanders metal band. That's right, and they are. I listened they to are Oakley Dokley. Yeah, but they, it's, I don't know, it's not as humorous, I think, um, as Austrian Death Machine. But going back to, have you, did you ever listen to Carly Rae Jepsen? No. All right, well, this was, because I know she played Pitchfork Music Festival a few years ago, and I don't know if that's when you were there. I but, was there when, when Japan Droids and Lauren Hill were there. I got VIP tickets from my boss at work. She was like, yeah, we're not going today. You want these? It's like, hell yeah, I want those. Yeah, why don't and, you? Yeah, and so I went, and Kelly and I went after we got off work. And Japan droids are awesome. They were super fun. I don't know if we've uh, talked about them before. We, I think we have mentioned them very briefly. Yeah. Uh, but it was more like in passing. But uh, we are in an hour. We are. Yeah, so, or 40 seconds short of an hour. Uh, so what did you want to talk about? I was just going to say Carly Rae Jepsen's uh, Emotion album is extremely catchy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the same person who did call me maybe but i, I, listened, oh, I know i, I listened know. to it today and it was uh it was very very enjoyable and i think as far as pop records go it was okay. something that uh is extremely satisfying to the ears and i would say go listen to it if you want okay. anything to do with it all right well i'm i'm gonna leave, i'm gonna cut you off there because what i wanted to talk about this week uh, my something old, uh, which we haven't really talked about, 
and I should have put the shirt on, but I didn't, and I wore it during another another episode. But uh, I wanted to talk about sorority noise. Speaking of lyrics, and uh, you had mentioned anxiety and depression a, a few minutes oh. ago. <laughs> uh, if you're not familiar with the band Sorority Noise, uh, I believe they're actually uh, they're from the East Coast, but um, they are technically, I guess, as far as I know, on an indefinite hiatus due to uh, some unfortunate rumored allegations, and I, I don't really know the story behind all of it. I just know that we might never hear from them again, which sucks. Um, but this week I spent some time going back through the album uh, of uh, You're Not As Blank As You Think, um, which is the actual name of the album. So um, if you've never listened to it, I love the album. The album starts off with, uh, with the song No Halo, which I'm sure you're familiar with now. Mm. Uh, I discovered this band uh, probably about three or four years ago. I was watching a uh, WKQX Sound Lounge episode with, what is the name of the uh, lead singer of Death, or not Death Cab, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Dashboard. Dashboard, thank you. Got my D bands mixed up. Uh, Chris what's Carabba. his name? Chris Caraba. Yeah. Uh, so Chris Caraba was asked in the studio session, what have you been listening to lately or what are you into right now? And this band Sorority Noise was one of the bands he mentioned. Uh, he's like, so I was like, all right, well, I wrote some of those down and I checked some of the bands out and Sorority Noise stuck with me. Um, when we had talked about the Smith Street Band, we talked about like honest and open songwriting and not being afraid to talk about like what's going on inside your head and just uh cameron lead singer i believe his name is cameron boucher who i had actually i had the uh the honor of meeting outside of their shows one day i talked to him <laughs> for like 15 minutes super cool dude uh if you've never listened to sorority noise which i'm guessing there's a decent amount of people listening to this podcast that have not listened to sorority noise um lyrically i think they're one of the most interesting bands i've heard in, in a while when you talk about songs that can range from like an extreme amount of like energy and enthusiasm to like the next track being one of the like one of the saddest songs you've listened to in a while. Um, this man clearly suffers from anxiety and depression in a pretty heavy way. And actually, when I was like looking some stuff up today uh, to 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 talk about it on the episode before I knew that Steve was going to be like, I'm super ill prepared, and we're not going to do our <laughs> normal show. Everything uh, up. Yeah, I found this video uh, on YouTube. And if you're a person that suffers from anxiety and depression, I think a lot of people do, whether they realize it or not. Um, there's this video, it's about five minutes long, where fans ask questions about dealing with a lot of their own anxiety and depression. And Cameron gives advice on it. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, like the first time I heard this band and I heard some of the lyrics to this guy's songs, I mean, I really, I, I mean, I remember saying to my roommate, I would not be surprised at all if this man kills himself. Like, I yeah. literally said that out loud. Um, and I think, you know, uh, you, some of the lyrics to these songs. So I went back and I, and I listened to I'm Not As Blank As You Think, or You're Not As Blank As You Think, uh, I believe is the name of the album. And the first song, No Halo, uh, opens with, you know, uh, I slept eight hours total, or this last week, I slept eight hours total, I barely sleep. And what's funny in the video that I watched tonight with him talking about his anxiety, he mentions that, you know, he talks about how there's there's times where like, I literally don't sleep, you know, for days and I do things that I shouldn't be doing. Um, and and uh, it's, just, it's just a brutal honesty and a look into a guy that clearly is struggling and has had friends commit suicide and has had friends dealing with the same thing that maybe haven't talked about it. Um, and then in the second song on that same album, uh, and I listened to it tonight and it gave me goosebumps listening to No Halo and the second song is called The Portrait Of. Um, and the second song, A Portrait Of, opens with the lyrics, I've been feeling suicidal and if I need to remind you, 
uh, it's not the coming of my heart and my brain. I was thinking about how great it would be if I could make the tightness in my chest go away. And like having my mom uh, who suffered from anxiety and depression for years, I hear her talk about the tightness in her chest all the time. And I'm like, when I first heard that song, that's exactly what I thought of. Yeah. Um, but then like, you know, you and I have talked about this line because I know you listen to it. Uh, the second part of that first verse, he says, it's been a while since I've seen God and I'm not trying to lead him on, but he's always trying to fuck me to the tune of my favorite song. <laughs> I absolutely love that line. Uh, it's dark, it's twisted, it's funny. Yeah. And uh, like when I met him, I told him, I was like, dude, I found your band because I told him exactly how I found his band because of the Chris Caraba thing. And he told me that he like, he stayed at Chris's house and he's like, it was an awesome experience. And he's like, Chris's house is unbelievable. And I'm like, that. yeah. Yeah. He's like, I was like, well, got that vindicated money. Yeah, exactly. I was like, yeah, yeah I got the Spider-Man two money. Um, but he said it was an awesome experience, like hanging out with him. Uh, you know, but I told him, I said, your songwriting is super honest. It's like, it's honest, but it's, it's dark and it's kind of funny at times because I think, and I didn't mean it in a bad way, but I think he got what I was trying to say to him. And he was like, thanks, man. Like, I really appreciate that. Uh, and he couldn't have been nicer. We actually talked about fish, which was hilarious. Yeah. Uh, he was telling me that he wanted to go see him at the gorge because he's never been at the gorge. Uh, Amazing. But and what I found out is like I found out from one of the other videos I watched, like him and the bassist, his bassist, I guess, used to play stand up bass. And Cameron plays, I think, like tenor sax or something like that. And they used to play in like a jazz band. Okay. Uh, and not know his ba- yeah, and his bassist said, he goes, I don't know why we don't play more jazz, but we don't. <laughs> that was like, that's what he said. Interesting uh, take. Yeah. And, uh, but this song, like at the end of this song, um, there's this call most like inaudible. And the song I'm talking about is, uh, is a portrait of, and like I said, like if you're having a rough time right now, whatever's going on in your life, I know things have been very weird for a lot of people with quarantine and all like, all the shit going on in the world and politics and everything. Um, But at the end of this song, uh, he kind of has this like spoken word part that's kind of lies underneath like all the noise of the song. And it's pretty, uh, I think it's pretty telling, but he says, since I was 13, I've dealt with manic depression. And it's all, like I said, it's all like this kind of like spoken word and it gets kind of angry and loud as he goes on, but you still don't necessarily understand what he says. And I've listened to the song a lot and always tried to figure out exactly what he's saying. And so I finally decided to look up the lyrics, you know, for this episode tonight. Yeah. He says, since I was 13, I've dealt with manic depression and I've had difficult time comprehending the things that I wanted to be. And I lived a very happy life and I was turning 18 and I was doing everything I could to try and make myself feel better. But I felt an absence. I felt like I needed to die. I felt like nothing existed. And I felt that I wasn't worthwhile breathing, the same air as the ones uh, I loved and my family. And then it came to a point where I started losing friends who had the same fucking ideas as myself. But I have to be strong and I have to live my life as a continuation of theirs lost. And I have to do everything in my fucking power to be the person that I can be. And I live my life the best and live my life the best way I fucking can. And some days it's so hard to fucking stand and he repeats that he says and fucking stand and fucking stand but the end of that song is so powerful it was all spoken in the song yeah it, like if you go back and listen to it i remember the first time i heard it i was like you can catch bits and pieces of it like what he's saying the first time yeah and i remember hearing it and being like man this song is fucking hard like deep and fucking like for real like this song is serious yeah. and I remember I like went, I rewound and I played it again and I couldn't pick up everything. And maybe I looked up and looked it up that night, but obviously like didn't remember everything. But uh, you know, I heard it tonight. I was going for one of my walks and I heard it tonight and I was like, I got to look this up again. I got to see what exactly he's saying. Cause I know he's saying some really deep shit. Cause you can pick up parts of it and you know, like, you know, I need to be the best. I, you can clearly hear the part where he says like, I need to be the best person I can be. Yeah. Um, like you can clearly hear that part and you know, like that's a conversation I think we all have with ourselves all the time, like that type of thing. So it's just one of those things. Like if you never heard this band, 
I highly, I highly suggest you check them out. Musically, it might not be for everybody. Uh, the album's awesome. There's a lot of great songs on this album. Um, and I, I, love, I love it. I love the album. I'll never stop loving the album. And uh, like No Halo, Portrait Of, Disappeared is a great song. And then they did that, what was it, like that EP or that earlier album called Forgettable. Um, yeah. Which has, uh, which has that great line. I forget the name of the song, but it's got that great line. It's and pretty I forgettable. My, but no, I, I forget the name of the song, but the, the lyric goes, I taught myself Spanish to tell you uh, I love you in ways that you could never understand. Um, like, I, I love that line. But like, and you know what's funny? That's the first line that like, so that was the first song that I heard from them that I was like, okay, I need to hear what else this band has because I heard that line and I was like, that's genius. It's clever, it's dark, it's funny, it's What twisted. else do you have to give me? Like, I wanted to know. Uh, so Sorority Noise, I wanted to talk about it tonight. Um, if you're a person that suffers from anxiety and depression, I highly encourage you to like, look this man up his name's cameron uh look up the band look up the interview i was talking about uh i definitely think he's uh he's so open and honest about things um and and like musically i, I really enjoy their music so uh that's all i wanted to say about it i wanted to talk about it before we we got off the the air tonight no and i uh just real quick to comment on that i've i've heard you talk about it many 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 times before I've listened to the first two tracks on that album and uh, I don't know if it was just, I, I don't know why I haven't gotten through it. Cause I've really liked the first two tracks, but I've never listened. Past but the that. third, but the third track is like devastatingly dark. It Maybe goes, that's it, why I just, it's listen. so the third track is like so dark. I listened to it tonight. I was like, man, this is wretched. Like it's, it's tough, but it's super sad. It's, I don't know. It doesn't make sense. You should love it. I you probably should, would. I need to give it another be, chance. You should be crying in a corner by yourself listening to the third song on repeat. This is the way. <laughs> this is the way. That's how I do things. And then followed up with two hours of nine eleven depression tracks, just <laughs> <laughs> repeating horn over and over and over. Um, I, I the one thing I will say, and then maybe I will take this as my homework and go listen to it for next week. Um, but every time you talk about the way you talk about sorority noise, have you ever listened to the hotel ear? No. Go listen. And I will make this your homework. Uh, go listen to home. Like no place is there by the hotel ear. How do have, you spell the hotel? Is it hotel space E A R or is no, it like, is it like a it's, one word L I E R? It's one word hotel I E R. Okay, that's what I thought. I was yeah. like, yes, I feel like George Costanza when he spells last names. Yeah. Um, I've wanted to recommend this album to you. Home Like so No long. Place? Home Like No Place Is There. Is There, okay. I don't know the best frame of mind, the best time to listen to it. Um, <laughs> I've been listening to Sorority Noise all night. I'm sure it'll be fun. <laughs> this is a perfect segue. I think this album, from what you are talking about, this shit, and it's it's relatively short. It's like nine tracks, but the first couple of times I heard this album, it was something <laughs> like, I don't know. It just, it struck so many chords um, all in that same vein that you were basically just talking about in terms of things that, uh, that had happened. And uh, there is a, a track in there um, and it, it deals with a, a person who had like committed suicide and uh, it, I listened to it basically the same time for the first time um around the time someone i i knew who had passed away uh without getting into it but it was just yeah. it was it was something that just that stuck with me yeah, so, yeah. so deeply um yeah. but yeah it's 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 a it's a hell of an album <laughs> i think honestly uh, if, you, if you're in the sorority noise mode right now like I'm really after, i'm really not in this rarely not in the sorority noise mode like there's some really sad songs on the album but there's so many good songs on their albums that like yeah and this is i can hear them all the time 
and it's it's not like that the like droning sort of like sad song thing like it's yeah. still got that like punk rock sort of vibe to it but yeah um, I think that you would really, really, really love this album. Well, and when people ask me like how to describe sorority noise, the best way I describe them to people is like, for me, it's like uh, they're not punk, they're not pop punk. They're kind of this like indie punk band is I think the best way to describe it. Um, yeah, if that makes sense, and I, I think it's pretty accurate. Um, you know, their music isn't necessarily for everybody and that's fine, you know, and that's the thing that Doesn't makes have to music, be. Yeah. You no, know, and that's the thing that makes music great. But from a lyrical perspective, and when you see this guy that uh, is not afraid to put his, uh, you know, the, uh, and it, it's not just him, but anybody that's not afraid to put uh, everything that's going on in their head out there. And when I hear him talk, like when I watch this video, it just made me think of, you know, it, it just reminds me of like what a healthy outlet music and writing can be for people that are struggling uh, with things like that. And it's awesome. It's awesome to hear somebody talk about it and uh, be as open about it as he is. Yeah. And I think it's, it's one of those things that when you try and explain it to somebody and it sounds, even when we kind of discuss it, sometimes it sounds a little uh, over the top dramatic, like yeah. talking about these topics because what happens is you put on headphones, you're in this headspace and you're by yourself, whatever. And you're alone with the music, you know, between your ears. And I still remember there was this like this, this time at work where I was just kind of working and I can't remember what song I was listening to, but it was kind of this like really sappy part in the, in the song. And I had my Bluetooth headphones and then all of a sudden I'm like working in an office, in a quiet office with many coworkers around. And then my Bluetooth just goes, Bluetooth disconnected. Oh, God. And then all of a sudden, the, the sad song I'm listening to starts playing out of my phone <laughs> for the most awkward 10 seconds of my life. <laughs> and everyone kind of stops and turns around. <laughs> And did, anybody, like, did anybody say anything no but like because we're professionals but it, i'm like fumbling around trying to find where my phone is <laughs> yeah but did anybody say like steve do you need to talk about anything are you okay need, need shoulder <laughs> need an ear to talk to um but it's one of those things where like and i always feel weird kind of talking to somebody else about like let's call them emotional albums emo albums like okay. albums that basically talk about your feelings like it's sometimes weird and like kind of dumb to talk about out loud but like when you're in that moment and you're listening to something and you're like yeah i do feel this way like it's okay to feel this way but like to talk about it out loud you get a little uncomfortable and well and that's, that's the stigma behind it though is but that's the thing like and when you watch this video of him talking about that he's like you have to you know he's like you end up finding out that like most people feel this way or have these feelings and I've said this to you before, like, I get the term emo, like I get, you know, it's development where it came from and all that shit. But like, music is emotional. Yeah. <laughs> it's naturally emotional. But the whole point of writing music is you are expressing an emotion, whether you're expressing it musically or lyrically, or combining both of them. So part of me hates the term emo because all music is emotional. You wouldn't be writing it if you didn't have an emotion. Like yeah. It doesn't make, you know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. Whether the emotion not, is fun or Yeah, angry. exactly. Yeah. Like, it doesn't make any sense. You're not writing the music because you're emotionless. That's fucking stupid. It, yeah. You can hear the anger in my voice. I'm getting emotional <laughs> right now, talking about it. So, uh, but it, it does drive me insane when people are like, oh, it's emo music. Well, all music's emotional, you know? Just like, just like every job is about money. <laughs> yeah, basically. When you like, boil it down, yeah. like... You're not working because it's, you know, for free. Or most of the time you're not. 99% of the time you're not. Some people but, are. Um, yeah, no, it's definitely, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, it's 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 okay to have those thoughts and feelings and frustrations and everybody has them. Some people have them more than others. Some people deal with them on a level that other people don't. Um, but I think one thing that Cameron does so well is uh, he lets them out and lets them out really well and, and, and describes them uh, 
in a way that's just like, you know, uh, completely unencumbered, I guess, is the best way to describe it. Like there's no hesitation, there's no fear in it. Yeah. Uh, similar to what we talked about, like I said, with the Smith Street Band earlier, there's just a lack of fear in singing those words and putting that stuff out there. So um, yeah, I mean, I encourage people that uh, that love like indie and punk music, if you've never listened to Sorority Noise, by all means, check them out. Uh, if you're going through tough times, by all means, check them out. I think there's some songs in there that will you'll connect with and enjoy and make you realize like, wow, there's other people dealing with the same shit I'm dealing with on a pretty regular basis and they're finding a creative outlet for it. So for sure. anything else you want to add? We are an hour 20 in. Nah. No. <laughs> Dude, I, I'm so slow. Uh, well, I'm for somebody that was not prepared, you were, uh, you were dynamite. You were dynamite this week, Steve. Could have been better. I, uh, next week, man, I'm going to come guns blazing. We're going to talk, uh, talk some music. Well, we uh, we did that this week, and we did it in under an hour and 30, which uh, for taking a week off, that's impressive, Steve. Yeah, So good for us. Uh, I'm proud of us. Way to go, team. Go us. Uh, and to the people that commented and gave us uh, road trip suggestions on a road trip, thank you. Um, if uh, you're listening and, and uh, you have any mailbag suggestions, leave them on the YouTube or the Instagram page. I'm sure we'll be posting some videos here um coming up this week we need another piano video from steve this week so uh berate him about that we need we need steve on the keys a little bit more all right uh, but yeah anything you want to add before we go no nah, man i'm going to bed <laughs> all right put on that uh put on that sleep relaxation uh youtube video i told you about I get my binaural beats there you go uh, thank you everybody for listening. We really appreciate it. Uh, we hope you had a great week and, uh, yeah, uh, check out some music and, and, uh, enjoy yourself. Have a good weekend, everybody. Actually a good week because we'll post this on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. All right. Goodbye, everybody.